Okay, uh, thanks Josh for the nice introduction and uh, welcome everybody. It's pretty amazing to see so many people joining here. Uh, and the idea to all this of course came up uh, due to the coronavirus uh, pandemia and the related cancellation of conferences and everything. And uh, we thought it's, it's just maybe a good offer and opportunity to, to connect everybody in these times, um, to have uh, research updates, get educational content out. Obviously, there's quite some demand for that. Um, and um, I suppose it, it would be great if it's, if it's becoming over time a platform for everybody interested in EV analysis and EV flow cytometry in general. And um, please uh, make use of the Slack uh, workspace that we have set up where you can ask questions now and we can also continue discussion over time independent of talks as well. It's supposed to be a place where you can ask questions in general, get help, connect with others that um, might be experts or, or share the same interests, uh, find collaboration partners, discuss uh, science related to EV flow cytometry. Uh, I think that will be quite valuable for everybody. Um, and of course, it's also like an effort of the working group, as Josh said, to, to drive standardization forward, and that's that's what we urgently need. Today, I will share a bit of the experience we had in our lab uh, with EV flow cytometry. I will talk about two methods, speed-based flow cytometry and single, uh, single EV flow cytometry or imaging flow cytometry. And the story I put it together is a bit in terms of extracellular vesicle heterogeneity, but I will try to give examples that might be useful as, an, as a start to this uh, to demonstrate a bit what kind of questions can be answered by EV flow cytometry and what kind of type of results can you get and how to, how to do that. Um, so as I said, I'm, uh, I'm uh, a postdoc in Samir el Andalusi's lab in Stockholm in Sweden. And uh, I would like to quickly mention or disclaim that we are closely working together with Evox Therapeutics in Oxford in UK, which is a, a startup that is working on uh, developing engineered EVs for therapy. Um, also got travel support by Milton E and Luminex. Um, and in our lab in Stockholm, we are also closely of focusing on producing engineered EVs for different biomedical applications. We are setting up a platform to engineer EVs in a way that you have proteins expressed on the outside or the inside uh, or drugs loaded or other molecules loaded into EVs so that we ultimately can deliver them specifically for, for different diseases. And um, of course, to produce therapeutic EVs, you need to set up um, a, a, a certain workflow or platform uh, that involves many steps. So we um, use different, uh, or we explore different EV producer cells. We need to genetically engineer those. Uh, then we need to uh, culture those cells and, and scale up those cultures to, to produce uh, enough conditioned medium um, to, to contain enough EVs that can then be isolated by different, different ways. Uh, and, and then uh, Finally, you end up with an EV sample that you want to test or evaluate in your preclinical studies. And of course, all these steps uh, include many different decisions, how to do things best or how to evaluate or compare um, engineering construct A and B and so on. So for all these decisions that are made, which cell type to use, which engineering construct is best, how to best culture cells, how to best isolate uh, EVs, and how to best store them, it's, it's valuable if you have uh, good analytics or uh, sensitive analytics in place to understand what's going on to make good decisions. And um, of course, we are exploring EVs in, in disease models in mice. Uh, we are doing some in vitro assays and we also use uh, default EV analysis techniques. And we found that especially flow cytometry based techniques are or can be incredibly useful to make good decisions and learn more about uh, our construct. And if you're more interested in this context uh, of EVs for therapeutic use, um, I'm just mentioning here that tomorrow morning, actually, I'm giving with Samir El Andalusi um, a talk about that exact topic in the web EV talk series, which is another upcoming uh, online uh, EV talk seminar series that is running for, for a few weeks already, and that is uh, definitely worth checking out. So if you're interested, join, join there as well.
Now coming to, to the overarching story of this, this talk, um, it's extracellular vesicle heterogeneity. And uh, just for, for those of you, the, those few of you probably that are not familiar with EVs yet, um, we, uh, the field recognizes three or, or identifies three basic subtypes of EVs that are often mentioned in the literature. It's, uh, and those are classified uh, since many years based on their cellular origin. Exosomes are coming from the endocytic pathway when multivesicular bodies fuse with the plasma membrane and release their vesicles, then they become exosomes. Uh, microvesicles, uh, but from the plasma membrane directly, and apoptotic bodies come from, from dying cells. Um, and all these subtypes have overlapping size ranges, and we can't actually separate them perfectly from each other, which is why the field uh, agrees to normally call what we isolate extracellular vesicles or EVs. And in, on top of these conceptual subtypes, um, you can, of course, imagine a higher degree of heterogeneity, um, especially in body fluids or in, in, in organisms. Um, if you imagine that different cell types, of course, release different kinds of exosomes, for example, or that even maybe one cell might release different kinds of exosomes itself. So obviously, there's quite some heterogeneity in, um, in organisms, in body fluids, and also potentially in, in all the samples we analyze. And of course, the more we understand about that, the better. So um, the, the objectives here to understand EV heterogeneity would be to define optimized and standardized methods to facilitate uh, robust detection of those on a single EV level, which is ultimately required to understand what's going on. And for that, we, we also need to define reliable markers for EVs or even EV subsets. Uh, and the downstream applications that we can use those for are then, of course, that we can fractionate subpopulations uh, that we can uh, test those then functionally and learn more about what their relevance is uh, and, of course, use them therapeutically and for diagnostics. So I will talk about two essays today um, that I think it's maybe good uh, to provide some kind of spectrum of what different kind of questions can be answered from those. Um, so the first one I would like to quickly introduces the multiplex bead-based flow cytometry assay. You see uh, that uh, you have, um, let me quickly check if I figure out how the, do you see my mouse cursor? I, I'm not sure if that works. I'm moving it. We can. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So on the top left, you see here that uh, this assay is uh, comprised from different antibody capture beads, which are hard dyed and can be identified in a multiplex way. Then you incubate those beads uh, with EVs, stain them with the secondary antibodies, and you can uh, detect if a certain marker set is co-expressed. We'll come to the details in a second, but basically it's a multiplex assay. It can be measured relatively fast on most flow cytometers, and it gives you semi-quantitative information about your sample, your, the EVs in your sample. Then uh, the imaging flow cytometry part is a single EV um, analysis method. It's, it's um, a dedicated instrument that uh, allows quite sensitive detection of, of single EVs. It's running very slow, uh, but it's uh, sensitive in that way. Uh, on the other hand, and you can analyze single EVs in a rather quantitative way. So coming first to some more details about the bead-based assay, as mentioned, you have 39 capture antibody beads that are uh, hard dyed, as you can see uh, here, and can be all identified. Each of those capture, uh, capture beads has a different capture antibody on those. So if you then uh, incubate your EVs with those beads, uh, they will bind to beads uh, respectively uh, on based on their antigen expression, and then you can use um, different antibodies for detection. In a default way, we use a, a pan tetraspanin mix of CD9, CD63, CD81 antibodies that are then fluorescently labeled um, to detect the beads that have found EVs, actually. So you see uh, already an example of uh, what you can get then if you run that at a flow cytometer. In this case, we just incubated the, or, or used this, um, this method with the HEC293T conditioned medium. And then you can, uh, you, see, you will get some 
beat, beat populations that, that are shifting quite a lot. And you can see the top candidates are marked here that can then be identified uh, in, in the uh, multiplex beat view. The type of data you get out of this is then for this, exam uh, this example, this kind of uh, uh, semi-quantitative assessment of co-expression of any of these markers listed on the y-axis here together with uh, any of the tetraspendins uh, that are uh, binding uh, or that are giving the APC signal. That means you can nicely detect the tetraspendins uh, up here and you also see that CD29 and CD49E are nicely being picked up. Again, this was from conditioned medium. Um, so um, since it relies on co-detection of uh, or two antibody bindings, first of all, the EV has to bind to the capture bead and then the detection antibody has to bind. You only get a signal if EVs are present. So there's no need to ultimately purify your EVs in many settings. So an important question for all assays is of course, how many, how many EVs uh, are you starting with? Like, how, can, how would you normalize the input? And there are different, definitely different ways. If you just use um, NTA-based particle counts um, in an increasing way or, or in, a, in a serial dilution as shown here, you see that for example, for 5E6 uh, particles, SA input, you already can detect the citrospendence, but you have to increase your SA input drastically um, up to 5E7 or 1E8 to, to pick, pick up uh, markers that are less abundantly expressed like CD29 or CD146 here, for example, where you need to increase the input. So that shows that you always have some kind of um, limit of detection, of course, as for all assays. Uh, and on top of this, uh, you should consider that uh, if you run a sample and uh, certain markers are negative, like uh, CD49E would be here for 5E6 EVs assay input, uh, you can conclude that these EVs are not expressing CD49E, but you have to um, increase the SE input to get more information if they are maybe positive or not. Um, since we are producing a lot of different EVs from different cell types, and after using different engineering approaches, we of course need robust EV isolation protocols. And we are still evaluating different ones, but what we what is shown here as an example uh, is that you can use this assay to basically for basically process monitoring. So you can um, use samples from different stages of the EV isolation and then check if the EV overall surface signature is changing over time. So at the top you see conditioned medium from Hectune and 3T cells, and then we compare here two. Um, EV isolation procedures, and then uh, the samples that are resulting, we again dilute it based on NTA counts to the same particle concentration. And you see if you quantify the main positive markers, you see there are some variation, but overall uh, you, you get quite reproducible results with both methods. Uh, and this is basically a snapshot or a serve like a, like a short uh, uh, signature that you get uh, where you can learn if you do a certain step, uh, are the EVs actually still there and are they maybe changed or are you biased for a subset and so on. Then, uh, as mentioned, we are of course exploring different, uh, different production cells for different purposes maybe. Um, as mentioned, every, EV, every cell type probably produces different EVs. So even though if we are engineering, it, it's interesting to still know how these EVs naturally are and how they work. So uh, in this case, we compared HEC 2 and 3T EVs with MSC-derived uh, EVs. Uh, if you run the, the default assay format, as I just mentioned, with the pan tetraspanin stain, you already see some differences. But then you, of course, can also vary the detection antibody use. So if, for example, if you just use CD9 or just CD63 or just CD81 for detection, you get some, some more level of information um, how um, how diverse different uh, EV populations are maybe. So in terms of heterogeneity, you already see that um, there are markers that are not expressed by, or, or less expressed at least by MSC EVs compared to HEC EVs. For example, CD9 is barely detected or is, is not detected in that case uh, above background for MSC EVs while it's clearly present and very high for HEC2 and 3T EVs. On the other hand, if you then capture or uh, detect with CD9, you also see that this is leading to no signal. So this just shows on a high level that you can use uh, 
this assay to, to compare EVs phenotypically from, from different cell types. Then, of course, uh, a question that we, we always get from, from people that regularly ask us if we can help them with their experiment is, is can you help me to show if a certain protein, protein is expressed or a certain marker is expressed on my EVs of interest? And that's uh, also something this assay can do. Uh, here you can see uh, in this example, PUNK1 cells and iGrowth cells. Uh, it's known that uh, folate receptor 1 is expressed on iGrowth1 cells, but not, uh, not PUNK1 cells. And uh, to just get some impression about the overall surface signature, we, we did this uh, plant heterospanin stain again. You can see some differences popping up. Um, but if you then use uh, a folate receptor antibody for detection, you can see clear differences and can see that there's nothing coming up in the PUNK1 control uh, sample, which is in this case conditioned medium, while it's clearly coming uh, up. Um, and we clearly detect signal for the iGrowth1 cells with this antibody, uh, as you see on the bottom right. And on top of this, this is uh, showing the kind of information you get in this case. So everything that is being picked up on this markers listed on the y-axis are uh, being captured on the respective beat population. And on top of this, uh, you can conclude that the, they are positive for folate receptor 1. So for example, we can confirm that uh, EVs from this cell line, um, at least a certain amount of EVs from that cell line is uh, CD326 or EPCAM, as seen here, positive and folate receptor 1 positive. If there wouldn't be double positive EVs, you wouldn't get that signal. So that's uh, giving you quite some information. Just quickly mentioning that we also tried that assay with, uh, with different biofluids, also in collaboration with Josh. Um, and um, it's an example shown here with uh, CSF, which is not very rich in, uh, in EVs normally. So if you use it rather unpurified or without without any concentration, you see you, you pick up the, the tetraspanins, but not much beyond. But if you concentrate the sample, you get more signal. And then by doing a dose dependent or, or by, by trying different doses, you can get more confidence that whatever you get is not background, um, but rather specific if it increases uh, with increasing um, dose of SA input. So um, since we do a lot of in vivo experiments, we also, of course, are interested to, to, to learn more about what EVs do in vivo. It's known that if you inject EVs into mice, in, in most cases, they are cleared very fast from the blood or from the circulation. So just uh, as a proof of concept, we here uh, treated uh, or injected MSC EVs into mice and then collected the blood after short time points and analyzed the plasma. If you see here we have an untreated mouse, you don't have any signal, so there's no antibody cross-reactivity. But after short time points, like one minute, you get quite some signal. You see, again, these MSC EVs are not expressing not a lot of CD9. It's rather close to background levels. And you also see the normal MSC EV uh, surface signature uh, being detected here. And you again see that after 30 minutes, most of these EVs are not detected anymore in the, in the plasma, which is in line with other um, published and unpublished data from us and others. So it's, it has some potential to also do some uh, in vivo imaging, uh, in vivo detection of EVs maybe. Uh, these were just a few examples. There's a, a lot more we did to try out and, and tweak maybe some parts of this essay. We are also collaborating with Josh, who also uh, did uh, work a lot with this essay and has some exciting data he's probably sharing in a future um, episode of this series. Um, so to summarize quickly, this we have optimized the protocol a bit of this assay. It's a multiplex detection, uh, and that gives you information about co-expression of surface markers. Um, it is semi-quantitative, but it's it's still helpful uh, to get some information about heterogeneity as well, or the EV surface signature or identity or quality overall. A uh, big advantage is that it can be uh, used on most flow cytometers and that uh, uh, mentioning again, to be clear, it's a bulk EV detection, not a single EV analysis method. So each bead that we uh, detect in the flow cytometer pro pro uh, probably has like thousands or hundreds of or thousands or more of EVs bound to that bead. Um, and what we see is a bulk signal. 
um, and it's 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 published. So um, please refer to the publication if you want to learn more. And now I want to talk a bit about imaging flow cytometry and our experiences there. Uh, this has actually started when I was uh, when I did my last postdoc in the lab of Bernd Kiebel in in Essen in Germany. And there we were lucky enough to have an Amnes image stream instrument uh, available, which is, um, I will come to that in the next slide. So let me just quickly mention it. It's a, it's a CCD camera based signal detection. It's, it's basically a flow cytometer, but has some imaging component uh, attached. It's, it's run, running with relatively low sample rates and in integrates signals on the CCD camera over time, which probably makes it much more sensitive than without that. Um, you can analyze single EVs and you can analyze multiple fluorescence and scatter parameters uh, at the same time, which is a big advantage. Um, and it's highly quantitative in the sense that you get um, also uh, concentration values that are apparently quite accurate to our experience. So, um, just a few more words about uh, image stream uh, analysis or imaging flow cytometry in general. Uh, the idea is that you have uh, data like dot plots or histograms like in normal flow cytometry, but you can gate uh, on each population or you can click on any dot and you get the image information on top. So it acquires images and extracts those uh, this data from those images. And uh, that means it can, for cellular analysis, which is built for, it can combine, for example, immunophenotypes, subcellular localization, and morphology of the cells, and you can quantify all those parameters. Um, and when we then started to um, explore this instrument or method for submicron particle analysis or for EV analysis, we first took or did what, what many people probably do in that case, just use some beads that you have in the lab and run them. Uh, in this case, we took uh, megamix beads, which are submicron polystyrol beads uh, that are fluorescent. Uh, and when you then run them, you can separate those beads. Um, you can see at the top the images, uh, you see bright field images from two cameras, scatter images, uh, and you can see the, the green fluorescent uh, channel plotted. Then the, the 1000 uh, nanometer beads are speed beads that are running in the system all the time for calibration. And then you can see the different beads that are having, if you go down in size, decreasing amounts up to no detectable bright field signals below like 300 nanometers. Uh, you can see scatter signals are quite nice until like 200 uh, nanometer beads roughly while fluorescence is being picked up everywhere. Um, and of course the lower um, the smaller those beads are, the less light they scatter. So they are uh, in that scatter low area, for example, those 100 nanometer beads, but still fluorescent positive. Um, then we also run 24 nanometer beads just uh, out of curiosity, and we could also pick up those, which basically shows for beads, uh, or uh, in general, even if you have no detectable bright field or side scatter signals, as for those, you still, uh, if you have fluorescent. Um, you can pick them up if it's bright enough. That's basically the conclusion. Uh, the thresholding works in this system on all channels simultaneously um, automatically. So you don't set a threshold channel or a trigger channel um, manually. You just, it's automatically recording any, any event that is uh, bright enough in any, in any channel above uh, the pixel values uh, of, the, of the background. So that uh, that said, uh, you can nicely identify beads or measure beads that are submicron sized. Uh, but of course, if we want to analyze EVs or, or even uh, EVs in the size range of exosomes, we we have to be sure that we we use different reference materials or uh, use different. Um, or let's say from this data, we can conclude that we uh, can analyze uh, EVs in the size range of an exosome. EVs are scattering light much differently and much less than polystyrol beads, so it's supposed to be much more difficult. So what we then did is preparing uh, GFP-tagged EVs and uh, proposed to use them as biological reference material, in this case, actually to explore different parameters of this method, how to measure samples, how to analyze the data, uh, and so on, since you have many different options with that system, 
So we prepared uh, by expressing CD63 EGFP in our producer cells, which are in this case THP1 cells. We prepared uh, EV preparations. Uh, with in this case with the uh, uh, differential ultra centrifugation protocol and uh, then we got a pellet at the end after 100,000 G centrifugation which um, would contain the GFP tech DVs. This has been done by others before for other purposes. And then when we run those uh, GFP tech EVs on our image stream, we saw that we could nicely pick up a population here at the scatter low area that is uh, fluorescence positive for the green fluorescence channel and that is devoid of basically bright field and scatter signals but has nice fluorescent dots. After seeing this we, we then invested quite some efforts to really make sure we have EVs and to learn more about how to ideally use um, this method to analyze EVs. I mean there are many parameters you can change. Uh, here's another example of like PBS only versus um, those EVs run at a concentration of roughly 3.5 E7 per ml. Um, uh, in this case, so you get the concentration if you if you um, look at the volumetry of the of the measurement. You get this also by the software directly. So you see, you have always some background that is not fluorescent, and the speed beats at the at the top here. But you get this scatter low GFP positive population when running those EVs. If you do a detergent treatment with NP40, you see those are gone. Um, and then we we uh, looked into different aspects. For example, what is uh, a good start to make sure you are actually measuring single EVs is uh, doing a, a serial dilution and measuring if the concentration, if you dilute twofold or uh, by your dilution factor, if you actually get the expected lowered uh, with the same fold. Um, concentration again measured for your population that was in the range of roughly one times 10 to the power of five to seven it was quite quite robust um, and on the on a side note the fluorescence intensity of those this population did not change when doing the dilution which is a further indicator that we are actually measuring single EV. Um, then we may be just quickly mentioning there are images, of course, as I mentioned, that you can process to get your data. Um, that also gives you the option uh, with the built-in software uh, to do basically everything you want with those images and also identify if you have single EVs or coincidence on top. Of course, you have differently bright spots of those pixels. Um, and sometimes we, we then saw like events where you have different pixels, then try different masks, which are basically um, defined regions by, by, different, um, by different approaches, how to process the image or how to mask the area of the image that should be processed. And then got different results. Um, to cut this story a bit short, uh, you can then uh, use the software built-in spot count feature, combine it with this intensity mask that we defined and quantify how many, um, what the percentage of single, double, triple, and so on events. And you can see if you have a high concentration, you have a lot of coincidence, uh, while if you lower your concentration, in this case to 27 objects per ml, fluorescent objects per ml, you get mostly single events. You can, of course, then use uh, those plots again to gate on respectively uh, identified or assigned populations and cross check visually if you actually have um, a proper properly working feature to identify singlets versus doublets versus triplets and so on. So that gives us more confidence, of course, that uh, we are actually analyzing single EVs. To quickly summarize, we looked into many more uh, parameters like. Uh, different acquisition parameters, also assigned some other masking settings to optimize the analysis. Um, and overall, um, it seemed that the EGFP tagged EVs are quite, quite helpful to learn more about uh, what is possible with the system. Um, please refer to this publication for some more uh, method optimization. Otherwise, um, here's an example that um, I find quite nice also to to illustrate that we actually are measuring, uh, let's say, small EVs. Um, so you can, and it's also showing a big advantage of that system over some other system, I guess, um, which is that you can analyze uh, complete cell cultures or unpurified samples. So you don't have to purify your EVs to analyze them. If you have fluorescent labels that are specific 
or if you have uh, probes that are specific enough that you can use in your setting. So for those GFP uh, positive EVs, again, uh, if we take the whole culture, uh, which are THP1 suspension cells, you can uh, see that you get, um, again, like a, a whole bunch of GFP positive events that are uh, being scatter low to scatter intermediate, let's say. And if you then look at the images of those gates that I drew here, uh, you see that in this gate R1 on top here, there are cells. Uh, below that, there are, it looks like membrane fragments uh, to some extent, maybe this is apoptotic bodies whatsoever. Uh, and then if you look in this scatter lower area, you see there are different, different populations coming up. And if you look at the images, you see some still have bright field signals while and scatter signals, while some only have scatter signals. And this population down here uh, called R5 uh, basically is devoid of detectable uh, bright field and scatter signals. And if you then do the, an EV isolation procedure as here with differential centrifugation, you see if you do a 2000G spin, measure the supernatant, you lose uh, the cells and some most of the bigger um, or this R2 gate events. If you do a 10,000G uh, centrifugation, you, you end up with an enrichment in that R5 gate while R3 is pretty much cleared up. And if you th do then an 0.2 micrometer filtration and measure the, the filtrate again, you see that you end up with this population in R5 at the end, uh, which is sites get a low uh, GFP positive uh, and most likely then highly enriched in, in smaller EVs. If you then do uh, an ultra centrifugation and look at the pellet again, you again end up uh, with mostly events in that R5 gate. So that's, I think, a nice illustration that it's, it's helpful also to evaluate an isolation method um, to have um that kind of uh, option to, uh, to to run differently pure uh, samples and to get the full spectrum between cells and evs in the same sample um, something that is of course of high interest then generally is using antibodies uh, for staining evs and ev subsets just briefly mentioning that we in this case again use the gfp evs uh, use cd63 uh, pe antibodies uh, to, to show if we can, or to see if we actually can label them and it works quite nicely. It's dependent on the antibody concentration, of course. Uh, you see some different concentrations of antibodies on the right side. Um, an important control here is using uh, buffer only, or in this case, PBS, together with the antibody and running this alone. You see there is background that is dose dependently coming up and which is a, a huge issue for uh, for some antibodies, so if you compare different commercially available antibodies, there are some that have a lot of this background. This is rather on the lower range. So it's essential to control for that. Uh, in terms of specificity, we also uh, included an isotype control, and you can see that this control, uh, if you just run it with PBS, also contributes to some, some background that is probably antibody aggregates or, or other uh, fluorescent background in that antibody tube. Um, a quick example about EV heterogeneity is, uh, is here again from the lab of Bernd Giebel, where we uh, are culturing MSC EVs, um, normally with plated lysate supplemented medium. Um, at this stage, we wanted to screen uh, for uh, different EV donors and how different, how different surface markers would be expressed on EVs. And we, we noticed uh, that if you run a medium control from those cells, and compare that to the supernatant that you get uh, quite high CD9 levels also in the medium control, while CD81 was only expressed when you look at the uh, MSC supernatant, if not the medium. And it turned out that indeed, um, if you look at this plot, that CD9 is being picked up a lot if you stain for CD9 and CD81 simultaneously uh, in the complete medium, but those EVs apparently are CD81 negative. While well, you see both populations uh, when you look at MSCs, uh, MSC conditioned medium, which means that the platelet lysate uh, we have used here uh, as culture supplement contained platelet EVs, obviously, and that those EVs are CD9 positive, um, while MSC EVs seem to be rather CD81 positive. So I think it's a nice example uh, that uh, even in unlabeled, otherwise unlabeled EVs, you can use antibodies to get some insight into heterogeneity in complex samples. Uh, of course, I also want to quickly mention uh, fluorescence calibration. That's also something I learned over the years. 
um, it's not super intuitive uh, when you when you come across it the first time, but it's extremely valuable and extremely important. Uh, so I showed you that graph of CD63 GFP positive EVs that are stained with the CD63 PE antibody. And this population here and this this plot, of course, is in uh, in arbitrary units of fluorescence presented. So that means it would show up like this on the exact instrument on the day we measured it. But it's otherwise not a meaningful scale on these axes. And if anybody else, even on the same instrument, would we do the same experiment, they might get completely different values. Um, so it's hard to compare data if you just report it in uncalibrated uh, values or units. Um, and it's it's very helpful if we then do a, an MESF calibration or a fluorescence calibration, which the best way for now is to use uh, calibration beads, which are commercially available for the respective channel or fluorophore you're using and running those. Those beads are uh, having different subsets of, no, uh, of different beads with known brightness in terms of PE uh, molecules, respectively. <clears throat> Sorry. And then you can uh, do a linear regression of your uh, measured uh, fluorescence intensity when you run those beads together with their known fluorescence value. And by doing that, uh, get a formula that you can use to calibrate your axis. So if you actually then apply this to our the same data set or the same uh, same plot, we we see that we now have uh, um, they, uh, our axis labeled in absolute units of FITSI and PE MESF, which is uh, much more helpful for comparison. And also, you could argue gives you some more uh, information about how many antibodies would actually be inbound, but this has further limitations downside. So I don't want to make that uh, conclusions here. And of course, this is not a perfect way to calibrate things, uh, but it's the best way for now to get more comparison, comparable data and to report data in a way others can reproduce it. Uh, just quickly mentioning that in um, aside from our method uh, optimization, I showed with the uh, image stream, we also uh, collaborated with a group in Hamburg that looked more into uh, brain tumor um, patients and their plasma and also different cell lines, which is also showing some nice heterogeneity of, of heterospanin expression. Um, I would like to also quickly mention that now in Stockholm, we are not using that image stream instrument that much anymore. There's a newer version, the cell stream, which we have started to explore. And uh, this is just one example showing that we also can run the scatter low GFP positive uh, events. Um, um, in, in this ex uh, instrument, we are still having ongoing comparisons going with, with the image stream and uh, are currently working to, to optimize this method in a similar way. You see a concentration curve on the right where you see that you have a very nice uh, correlation between uh, if you do a dilution series uh, and respectively um, detected objects then over time. Um, also, I would like to give you a quick outlook, since we are working here in an EV engineering lab. Um, we, of course, think that we, I mean, you, you have seen that we can GF, use GFP tagged EVs for some purpose um, as reference material and that it's helpful to understand or to set up things a bit more. Of course, we need different reference materials or, or calibration materials ultimately for different purposes. Um, one thing that is uh, that this, these EVs are maybe interesting is maybe for compensation or as a positive control. So what we produced here um, originally uh, or still in parallel um, designing those for, for uh, the purpose of uh, delivering uh, therapeutic drugs uh, more specifically are EVs that express an FC binding element on their surface. So in this case, we are still having a GFP tag uh, for evaluation. And uh, so the EVs that are resulting are uh, binding antibodies with their FC part on their surface while still being GFP fluorescent. And we, evaluating, we are still evaluating them to in different contexts, uh, aiming to use them to put therapeutic antibodies ultimately on those EVs and then deliver uh, maybe drugs that we load in those EVs uh, specifically to a certain cell type. Uh, but in terms of EV flow cytometry, 
uh, it's also nice to see uh, that we can use them maybe as kind of some control for, for certain experimental contexts. Uh, you see at the bottom here uh, one example where you uh, where we just have unstained GFP positive uh, control EVs and these FC binding EVs. And then if we add, uh, in this case, an APC labeled isotype control IgG, um, in increasing amounts to those EVs, you see no binding in the control EVs and nice dose dependent binding in the FC binding EVs. So uh, those EVs would bind any antibody with a suitable isotype that uh, you would add. So it's kind of a nice control to have if you want to test how how your antibody would work if it's uh, if it's binding uh, or if it's if it's bound to EVs and and maybe some study some related things. So as a quick summary, I showed you some examples from the multiplex speed-based assay and from the single vesicle flow uh, imaging flow cytometry method. Um, they have different purposes, but they are both valuable. We, we use basically often the, the bead-based one for screening, identifying markers that are overall positive and so on, while using the single vesicle flow uh, imaging flow cytometry approach then to really look into heterogeneity and more quantity of the uh, and of course, yeah, um, that would be my summary so far. I'm, uh, of course, thankful for everybody who contributed. I really hope I didn't forget anybody. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, very thankful that so many of you joined. I already saw uh, that many people have asked questions. Um, so I'm happy to catch up on that. If you want to discuss any time um, about uh, EV flow cytometry or have questions afterwards that you follow up, want to follow up, you can always contact me by email or uh, at Twitter. Thank you. Great. So we have. Yeah. Oh, there's some feedback. Yes. Here, right? yeah, so we have a lot of questions. Um, I will start up at the top where we have uh, mainly multiplex questions. Uh, so Joanne has asked, how does the affinity play into possible competitive binding and steric hindrance preventing binding of some antibodies? Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, we have no, to, to give a short answer, we haven't looked into that at all. Uh, but you have to consider it, and um, of course, what is what is meant also is um, that uh, if you put EVs that have a lot of different surface antigen at vastly different abundance, probably, if you put those to 39 different beads, and it, they might bind based on their antigen profile to different bead subsets, um, it's not absolutely stochastic, probably. So. Um, while this is hard to really study without having all those speed subsets uh, separately, um, we just consider the, the results from that assay as uh, a rough estimate of, of how abundant or how positive EVs are for a certain antigen. So um, I would not make a strong conclusion of a 10% fluorescence difference uh, or something. I would rather categorize things that are like not detected, uh, low detected, and high detected, and then that's the information we need. And then you have to, um, for for getting more information about the the actual diversity of of antigens and their expression levels, you have to do single EV flow. Um, we have another question asking if you normalize the results from your maxplex. So actually, we, we haven't done that much uh, for this. Uh, uh, Josh is definitely the expert for that. So maybe he can amend after I briefly answered that uh, we, we basically presented mainly raw data. Um, uh, or yeah, let's say normalized in a way. Yeah. Um, you can do different things probably in that context. What, um, what we have done is the background subtraction. Uh, definitely, and these are all the values that are showed. But in normalization, that is showing the data in a more meaningful way, well, way is something Josh is working on at the moment. So maybe he can catch up on that. Um, so one of the questions is, what happens if the EVs express two or more molecules uh, when they're incubated with these capture beads? Yeah, again, ultimately, I don't know. I guess some will cross-link to two beads or multiple beads, um, or they will just 
stochastically to some extent bias to some other extent bind to a certain EV subset. That's what I imagine. But ultimately, um, I don't know. Um, so again, I would rather rely on uh, a semi-quantitative um, quantification and conclusion in the way of it being either high or low. Uh, and of course, it might, uh, might hamper the detection of, of low abundant antigens in particular. Um, so I just want to say uh, people asking questions, if you can put them into the Slack channel, because um, there are a huge number coming in uh, on the WebEx that I can't keep up with. Um, so there, there are a lot of questions on the kind of the technicalities of the image stream. Um, so there are some questions asking what you think of the roundness factor as a first gate to select for EVs. Um, and how do you control for coincidence between labeled EVs and speed beads? Um, yes, yeah, so a pre-gate of like using these roundness features and so on, these are mostly, uh, would mostly rely on bright field or scatter, uh, mostly bright field images. So for cells, you can nicely, of course, separate around from an elongated cell, for example, and then it makes a lot of sense if you're interested in that to, to pre-gate on these. Uh, we are not pre-gating on, on any bright field or, uh, or shape. Um, uh, parameter. We are mostly interested in the, the ones that are scatter low and devoid of bright field and scatter. Otherwise, for um, for the single EV detection, it's it's a bit more explained in, in that paper, but we, it, it makes more sense, I think, to directly go for fluorescence. Maybe I probably also didn't mention clearly enough that this method can only, as, as, as I see it at least, only reproduce or like reliably detect small EVs that are fluorescent. So if your EVs are not fluorescent, you wouldn't see them and you, you we have no idea how many non-fluorescent ones there are. And of course, also by default, if you if some EVs are not bright enough by GFP, we also might not see them. So um, we have some limitation as most or all methods have in terms of what we see is only about a certain threshold. Of course. So that's that's what you have for now, generally, you can't you can't change it that much. Uh, of course, we are working on improving this more, but yeah, that would be. So another question here is, um, how do I check the percentage of labeled EVs versus unlabeled EVs if all of the um, EVs are not detected by the image stream? Should I use GFP positive EVs for this optimization? I think that's a, a, a very good question and a, like a, a question that comes up comes up often. Um, it, unless unless you have something you can use to generally labeling all EVs, and then use another label that is not competing with the first label or interfering, then you could probably uh, make an estimation of what percentage of total EVs are having your marker or similar. Um, I'm not aware of a really good way to do that. Uh, any dye you would use would cause background and maybe not lay or maybe not label everything. Um, if you if you use as we did here CD63 GFP to label EVs, you might very well have GFP negative EVs that are in your sample that express maybe also your marker, but they that are not. Um, so, so it's not all EVs you're labeling. Um, so it's something we also work work with, but um, I'm not aware of of a really good way to do that super accurately. So it's it's for now an ongoing thing. So a, another probably point I'd add to that is the flow cytometry working group. If you check out the MyFlowSite EV framework, um, it's highly recommended that we don't use percentage positive or negative for any EV um, reporting, because most of our EVs are probably going to be undetectable. Um, what we do recommend is that you calibrate your axis into known units, and then if you decide to gate your EVs as positive or negative, you say this concentration of EVs above this number of fluorescent molecules or this diameter were positive for a marker, um, and that makes things much more reproducible than um, presenting things as positive, um, which is a very subjective thing depending on how much of a population that you're detecting. Yes, I fully agree. I mean, so many aspects that uh, one has to look in, uh, and many things that you have to 
consider when you when you do an experiment. So I think it's sometimes hard to to get started with like an experiment if you're not having a lot of experience. So I think it's it would be great if we work together to get more clear guidelines and and educational material together to to make that easier. I mean, I, I would also profit from that. It's not that I I, I learn with every experiment and it. Um, it's it's a very exciting approach, but it's it's like not like an approach that gives you a lot of information without uh, a lot of standardization and optimization. So we have another multiplex question asking if you've tested um, different isolations and see differences in profiles, and also if you've tested um, sort of biological fluids like serum and plasma, and if you've tested those, do you see lots of non-specific binding? Um, that's a good question. Um, so for isolation methods, we have uh, evaluated different ones, mostly aspects of this ultrafiltration size exclusion approach. Um, but basically from the bead based system, we did not see like any method that is like extremely disqualifying. However, as said, it's, it's semi quantitative. So if you want to have the full image, it would probably be better to, to or the full picture, it would, would be better to use Another approach in terms of quality, I never saw like a huge difference, even though we did not have a super comprehensive look. Uh, in terms of quantity, you see definitely huge differences uh, based on the methods you use. Um, let's say from yield or from recovery, uh, how much you lose in each in each method and how much scalable things are and how uh, how operator dependent those methods are as well. For biological fluids, we actually have tested uh, almost all biological fluids in an ongoing study. I, I didn't mention that here, but we have compared EVs with this bead-based assay from like 50 plus different cell sources uh, by applying different markers or antibodies to, to study their marker heterogeneity. Um, didn't have the option yet to put that together properly, but uh, we're working on that. And uh, related to this, we also have looked into 10 different bi biological fluids um, and are looking into an approach with to, to analyze those without a lot of processing, which is in many cases possible. Um, and you get quite some diversity between body fluids in terms of marker expression, uh, but some are indeed uh, prone to background, especially blood plasma or serum. That's also included in the, the first paper we had, where, where Josh had a look more into uh, the different like purified versus non-purified plasma and serum EVs at different doses. Maybe check out that. We see sometimes um, bead populations coming up as false positive, so that's something we need to control for. Um, so yeah, there are limitations and there's sometimes background coming up, depending how you prepare your body fluid sample. But generally, it is possible, let's say, from um, from like 20, 30 microliters of, of saliva or uh, or urine or something to get quite nice surface uh, marker profiles. So we have another question here saying, how can you say that the, uh, so this is regarding the Maxplex, how can you say that a protein is really expressed by EVs and it's not just background noise? Is there a threshold that permits you to distinguish the true positivity of one protein mar marker from the background noise? Yeah, that's uh, definitely a valid point. That's why I was talking about uh, interpretation of the data and making conclusions in a rather semi-quantitative way. Also just having mentioned that sometimes certain beat sets are coming up as false positive. Uh, so what you, what you run is uh, your uh, your your sample of interest with the beads, incubate that and stain that with your antibody detection antibody of interest. And of course, you do the same thing without EVs being present. So that's uh, accounting or like that let us see some amount of background that is just coming from false positive binding. And that is normally quite low. In some cases, as mentioned for body fluids, it's, it's rather high, but then you at least um, would know some kind of that background. Um, otherwise, if something is close to the background, I would probably not conclude. Um, or I think it's hard to conclude that it's positive or like ultimately no, it's positive. Uh, if you 
I have a specific protein in mind, I guess it's probably uh, easy to either validate then the expression of that protein by a classical bead based flow cytometry where you prepare like dedicated capture beads for that specific protein um, and use that for capture and then use in term, terms of detection another uh, antigen which might make it easier for you. Otherwise, uh, use a single EV flow cytometry to, to then really, in case of question, um, make sure um, with another method if it's really expressed or not. Okay, I will ask one last question and then I think Andre will uh, follow up with your questions on Slack afterwards. Uh, so we have quite a few questions here from Edwin. Um, I'll just ask one or two of them that are related. So. How reproducible is the multiplex bead, uh, bead set um, in terms of coefficient of variation in fluorescent signals? Is there batch to batch variation? And would it make sense to standardize the measurements so that re they're reproducible in terms of molecules of equivalent soluble fluorophore rather than just uh, in arbitrary units? Um, yes, two good questions. Um, the reproducibility we have tested to some extent by just comparing um, how, how how the results are changing if you if you run the same EVs if you apply the same EV sample to that assay and stuff. So that is something we have done. We have not comprehensively looked at reproducibility between batches. We we have seen some batch batch variation, definitely. Um, and we also have seen different backgrounds sometimes in different lots. Um, so that's definitely something one has to control for and has to be, be careful with. And I fully agree with, uh, uh, with the second question. Of course, we should report data again in MESF units and make it more comparable. And it would make total sense to do that. And uh, all, all future data uh, we are generating are actually uh, or will be MESF uh calibrated and be reported in, in absolute units of course so that's also an, an ongoing learning process for us i mean when i started i i had no idea how you would do that exactly and over time also with especially a lot of help a lot of help from josh uh, and joanne actually we i figured out how to how to do an mesf calibration and i have, I have to say it's actually not super hard and it's not very time consuming it's just just something you have to we have to do once and probably we should have some educational content here eventually making it easier for people to do it as well. Great, so we'll wrap up there. Thank you again, Andre. Um, Andre will go to the Slack channel. There's a, a huge number of questions there that need answering um, and we will follow up in two weeks time with the presentation from John Nolan on the MyFlowSite EV framework. Um, the recorded version of this webinar will be available from the EV flow cytometry website um, and you can go there to keep up to date with um, how this uh, seminar series progresses and to check up and coming speakers. So thank you everyone for joining.